Welcome, everyone, to a new edition of the PhD Talks. Uh, today, it's my honor to introduce uh, my lab mate and friend, Luis Chamon. Uh, Luis got his uh, bachelor's degrees and master's, both at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil in 2011 and 2015, respectively. Uh, in 2015, he also joined uh, UPenn, where he's been working towards his PhD with Alejandro Ribeiro. And today, he's going to be talking to us about uh, part of his work on experiment design. So without further ado, Luis. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, so as Santiago mentioned, I'm going to talk today about giving uh, performance guarantees for experimental design, which is a very useful tool that finds applications in the science where you design actual experiments. But it also has applications in statistics, for example, for complexity reduction, uh, with names such as core set selection or sketching and uh, semi-supervised learning, so to design semi-supervised uh, systems, but also in signal processing and controls also where you find it with names such as uh, sensor placement or sensor selection. Those are all similar problems. Now even though it's very useful, it's also a very mathematically hard problem. And to give an intuition as to why that is, we can look at a sketching application which is based on face recognition. So this is Jane Doe, and we would like to give a picture of Jane to a computer and have it recognize her among other characters, right? The way we do this is by first taking the picture of, jo of Jane and projecting it onto a, sh a smaller spot subspace, right? We can learn this projection using either some flavor of PCA, and then we take this smaller subspace, these features, and pass them through a classifier to get the classification we want, which is whether it's Jane or not. Now in this talk, we're going to assume these two steps are linear, but there are other applications where this is not the case. It's just that the problem we're looking at is actually complexity reduction, not really making this classifier better. The problem here is about this projection. So this projection has the complexity of, of performing this projection is the same as the, is basically proportional to the number of pixels in this picture, right? Which in the case of this small headshot alone is already 10,000 pixels. So this is a complicated uh, step, even though it's a linear, just a simple linear transformation, right? So the way we go around this is by thinking of this problem sort of in reverse. So we can think of every pixel of this picture as a manifestation of the features we would like to acquire, right? So every pixel here is actually a linear combination of these features plus some noise. And we know this linear combination because we know this matrix is projection matrix here. So what we're going to do, what we would like to do is to find a subset of these pixels so that we can estimate not the features, but directly the output classifier. Right? That's, what, that's the goal that we want. So our goal is to design this, say, subset D of pixels that we're going to choose. Now intuitively, we already know this is something we could do. Because if we look at this picture, we clearly can recognize Jane from a, just a portion of it, say, a piece like this. The problem with this, say, unprincipled way of choosing pixels is if we keep cropping stuff like this, we can end up at a point where we don't recognize anyone anymore. In fact, this isn't even Jane Doe, it's actually Academy Award winning actress Jane Fonda, right? So we need a principled way to be choosing these pixels and the way people usually do this, which is the way we're gonna look at today, is by doing greedy search. So greedy search, basically we pick pixels one at a time, choosing whichever pixel of the picture most improve our uh, classifying uh, abilities, so the task at hand, which is just minimizing the misclassification error. So if we do this on the picture of Jane, we can actually find a set of 35 pixels from which we can recognize Jane with the same misclassification error as if we were to look at the whole picture. Right? So in conclusion, basically the conclusion of this talk, in the beginning of the talk now, if there is only one thing you should remember from this is greedy experimental design, which is what we're going to look at, perform not only very well in practice, but is also guaranteed to do a good job. So it is well known that greedy experimental design performs well in practice, but what we're going to do today is prove that actually that has to happen. Right? So in order to do that, we need to formalize the experimental design problem. So basically, the abstract experimental design problem, we are given a pool of experiments, which in the case of the, the sketching was the pixels in, were the pixels in the picture, which are just linear noisy observations of some parameter theta that we are interested in somehow. We are given experiments and some priors, both on the noise and on the parameter, and we want to find a design, D, which we allow to be a multi-set. And the reason why we allow for that is because there may be experiments that are very good at estimating theta, 
they bring us a lot of innovation, a lot of information, but they're very noisy. So we might want to do them a couple of times so that we can average them out and improve their SNR. And our problem, basically, is to use these experiments in the design to estimate some linear combination of the parameter theta, which could be the identity, if we are interested in theta itself, or could be some classifier represented by this matrix H, if we are only interested in some output of, uh, of some linear transformation. Now, what, interesting, what is interesting to us is that this problem, the, given the design, the problem of estimating Z has a well-known form, which is just a Bayesian estimation problem, whose error uh, such that the error of the estimator is well-defined, is actually can be written in closed form by this uh, matrix form. So the error covariance matrix of the estimator we are interested in for this problem has a closed form. Our problem now is not the estimation problem itself, but actually designing this D. So the problem, the answer, the question we want to answer is find the question, the goal that we have is to find a design D of a certain size, which represents our budget, how many experiments we are allowed to run, right? Such that we minimize this matrix, which minimizes the error. Now, minimizing matrices is a neo pulse problem, even for positive semi-definite matrices. So we actually look at some scalarizations of this, of this problem, which will lead us to what is usually called in the experimental design literature, alphabetical optimality criterion. So in alphabetical experimental design, they're called like this because they have these names based on letters. Um, so for example, in A-optimal design, we're gonna minimize the trace of that matrix, of the error matrix, which represents the MSC, the mean square error of the estimator. In E-optimal experimental design, we are actually going to look at the maximum eigenvalue of that matrix, which is a sort of a robust version of the trace because in, it somehow minimizes the error for a choice, for a worse choice of this matrix H. And the optimal experimental design which minimizes the determinant or the log that of the matrix. And that's, uh, that's related to the uh, volume of the confidence ellipsoid of the estimator for, for Gaussian data. We have these normalizing constants here which just guarantee that when we estimate this function at the empty set, it gives us zero. It's just to simplify the results later. But these are just constants that don't really change the nature of the optimization problem. So these problems, the ones we want to solve, they are actually cardinality constrained, discrete optimization problems, which are mathematically hard in the sense that, for example, this first problem here is NP-hard in general. You can map set cover into this. This third problem here is a submodular minimization problem, so it's actually NP hard to approximate better than one minus one over E. So these are actually very hard problems. So the way people solve them in practice or approximate them in practice, approximate the solution since we can't really solve them, is by using greedy experimental design, which was the thing we saw in the beginning. So you pick the experiments one at a time, always choosing whichever most improves your uh, objective function, whichever objective you have chosen to minimize. And the reason why we like greedy is because it ha it's a low complexity. Well, compared to the, uh, the exponential time it would take to actually solve the problem exactly, that's much better. But it's actually very close to linear. And there are even linear, um, linear random versions of greedy, which are basically as simple as, as you could get in, in this case. They are also sequential, so they build the solution sequentially, which means that at any point I can stop them. If I have gotten to, say, a performance that, okay, this is good enough for me, I can stop here. And also, they are near optimal when the objectives, when the cost function is super modular. So they, they get within one minus one over E, also known as 0.63 of the optimal value of the objective. Now the problem for us is that, even though the third problem is a super modular minimization problem, the two others are not. Right? They are known not to be, there are counterexamples to their, their being supermodular. There are some cases in which, for example, a optimal experimental design is supermodular, but those impose very stringent constraints on the experiments themselves. They have to be extremely incoherent, they have to be almost orthogonal to each other. In which case, actually, designing is trivial. So, actually, these two problems that are not supermodular are the ones we are interested in. So how, the, how people, the way people solve this is by doing two, th two things. There are two approaches. One is to use a supermodular surrogate. So we would like to solve problem A, A optimal design, but instead
solve D, which is circular, and just use the result of that as if it were A. Problem is, this is a v the determinant is a very bad surrogate for the trace. Just think about the determinant as the volume of an ellipsoid and the trace as the principal axis. You can make the volume very small, even though the principal, uh, principal axis is large, just by making one of the directions extremely small, right? So you can make the volume very small. So it's not, this sort of distorts the, the solutions of that problem. The second thing people do then is to just use greedy anyway. You just apply greedy to these problems, even though there, there are no guarantees. And it in fact works very well in practice, right? So if we compare here the solution of greedy for A and E optimal design compared to different convex relaxations, which are these red and, um, red and yellow curves, you can see that greedy actually works very well for both these cases. And the question we want to answer is actually why? Why is it that greedy works unreasonably well in cases where it shouldn't because the objective is not supermodular? Right. Any questions so far? Why? Well, okay. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay, to answer why, we're going to look at approximate supermodularity. This is the thing that is going to give us, this is the tool that is going to give us the, the why does greedy work so well. So supermodularity, this thing we mentioned uh, before, is actually related to some sort of diminishing return property of functions. What that means is that if you have a small design and you add an experiment, you tend to gain much more than if you added an experiment to a larger design. That's the idea. If the super if the function is supermodular, then this type of things, this type of diminishing return property occurs. Now, those functions we talked before are not supermodular, so they violate this inequality here. What we can do to address that is to allow for this inequality to be violated, but in a controlled way. Right. So the first way we say relax that inequality is by adding a factor, a contraction factor, on the uh, left hand side right-hand side of the inequality. So we allow for this side to be larger, for the larger, say the gains in the larger uh, designs to be larger than the gains in the smaller designs, but only by a small factor. So if alpha is 0.9, this thing, this delta in here cannot be much larger than this on this side, right? Now if alpha is equal to one, then we just recover the same uh, definition we had before. So we have vanilla supermodularity in a sense. The other way we're going to relax this is in an, by an, uh, in an additive manner instead of a multiplicative manner, which is just by subtracting a little bit from the right-hand side, which allows the right-hand side to be larger, but now by an additive factor. So we, add, we subtract an epsilon larger than zero. Again, if epsilon is equal to zero, we just have supermodularity, the vanilla supermodularity. The interesting thing about these two definitions is that actually based on alpha and epsilon, alpha and epsilon, they don't only measure how close we are to a supermodular function, how much we violate supermodularity, but they also measure how much we lose in terms of optimality due to that violation, right? So this is the next theorem here. What we are saying is that compared to the value of the optimal, the value of the greedy, which in this case we allow to be larger than the constraint, and I'll talk about this in a second, has this factor, this optimality factor here, which is very similar to the one we got for, for uh, supermodular functions, so we look at it. The reason why we're gonna allow for the cardinality of the solution we're gonna give, the greedy solution to be larger, is because we may want to violate, we may want to measure how much do we need to violate the constraint, our budget constraint, in order to recover the same guarantees that we would have if the function were supermodular. So the one minus one over E, right? So let's take a look at what that means. If L is equal to K, so we don't violate the constraint, we get exactly the, the amount we, of experiments we want. Alpha is equal to one, or F is equal to zero, so the function is supermodular. Then we recover the optimality that we had before, the 0.63 optimality that we had before from these formulas. Now on the other hand, if alpha is less than one, right, so in, in the approximate supermodularity region, in that case, we would need to increase the number of experiments we need to choose by a factor of one over alpha in order to get the exact same guarantee that we had for a supermodular function. So to get the one minus one over E. So in a sense, alpha measures how much I violate that diminishing return property and also how much I need to get more, how many more experiments do I need to get, how much I need to violate my, my budget constraint in order to recover from the fact 
that I violated that diminishing return in the first place. We can get a similar result for epsilon. It's a little messier, though, because epsilon is an additive guarantee, right? So even though for alpha supermodularity, we can get this guarantee, which is multiplicative, which is a, a near, near optimal guarantee that is multiplicative, for epsilon, we can only get an additive um, guarantee. Now, the reason why we care about those two is because the epsilon supermodularity is very easy to calculate epsilon. There is a trick that works for any function, which is based on homotopy, that gives you epsilon for basically any function you want. Alpha is a little trickier. It depends on the specific function you are looking at. So, so you need to get more work, say, to get a better, uh, a better theoretical guarantee. Now, the problem we have, and these results are nice, but what is the value of alpha and epsilon for a given function? The problem for us is that these problems, they are combinatorial themselves. So to get the guarantee for our function, we need to solve a combinatorial problem, which was what we needed to do in the first place to get the exact answer for the experimental design problem. So we might as well do that. Right? So what we're going to do is give bounds on the values of those, which are based on spectral inequalities for that matrix. So these are very s simplified versions of the bounds we have in the paper, just for um, diagonal priors and no, no saying we are interested in estimating theta itself, so no transformation of the, the parameter we're interested in. And we can get for A optimality, we can get a bound on alpha, and for E optimality, we can get a, this bound on epsilon. Both bounds depend on this parameter gamma, which is a measure of the SNR of the experiment. Right. So, Let's just look at alpha because the results for gamma follow the same, have the same flavor or the same interpretation. And the idea here is that as gamma goes to zero, so as the SNR decreases, alpha goes to one, which means that for low, at low SNR, the MSC or the A-quality criterion behaves almost as a supermodular function. So you have the same guarantees almost as we would have for a supermodular function. This is good because this is actually the regime we care about. In high SNRs, Almost any design you pick is good. They all have basically the same uh, performance. So it's, it's, this is actually when we care to do experimental design. And that is very fortuitous because in high SNR, actually, our bounds are just trivial. They just say that alpha is larger than zero. So in the case where we actually care about doing experimental design is when we say that actually experimental design works very well. We'll see that these bounds actually, as in the original guarantees for the greedy, for greedy search, they are very loose because they are worst case bounds. <coughs> so a typical, typical performance in practice is usually much better than the one predicted by this, these guarantees. But the idea here is that in the worst case scenario, we have a, a, a theorem that tells us that you cannot do worse than this. Right? That's what we're caring about. The third thing that impacts here is the size of the design itself, K. Okay. And the reason for that is because we allow for experiments to be chosen many times. And that worsens the, the bound. It has to worsen with the size of the number of experiments that we pick, because we can pick a very bad design just by choosing one experiment k times. Now, the thing is that the decrease, this is bad, but not linearly in k. If you look at the full expression for alpha, it decreases much slower. But still, it's, it's, it's one of the, say, um, restrictions of, of this, if you have designs that are very close to the full, then the guarantees that we give are not very good. But then again, you are very close to the optimal solution, which would be to just get everything, to just do, run every experiment. Now, in numbers, what that looks like is that we can see that both alpha and epsilon, as we predicted, as the SNR decreases, epsilon goes close to zero, and alpha gets very close to one. Right? In, in fact, if at SNR of minus 10 dB, roughly, instead of picking 40 experiments, we only need to pick 55 to get 1 minus 1 over E optimality. So already at minus 10 dB SNR, we have to violate very little the budget imposed in the first place. Right. So before we go to applications, any questions about this crazy? I'm either making a lot of sense or no sense at all, right? OK. Um, so let's go back to the face recognition application now that we have sort of a principled way to choose pixels. Uh, 
We can do better than just using PCA, which was what we were, we were doing before. We can use a kernel method, just using KPCA, basically, to learn this projection. The problem with kernel methods is that in PCA, this projection had the, um, the complexity of the number of pixels of the picture. Now, it has the complexity of the number of pixels times the number of training elements. So the number of elements in the training set. So this is a much worse problem. It's a problem, in fact, that you could even do without doing this type of core set selection, as they call usually in this type of, uh, in, the, in, the liter in the statistics literature, without selecting, appropriately selecting which kernels you are actually going to evaluate. So we can do the same thing we did before. So here is an example on the FACES 94 data set, which is a data set with uh, 3,000 pictures, roughly. And what we can see is that, indeed, as the design increases, as we pick more pictures in the core set to evaluate the, um, the projection, then the misclassification error decreases. But the rate at which it does depends a little bit on the, on the number of components we have. Right? So the best way to choose actually how, what's the size of the design and the number of components is just by cross-validation. Because these things are now in a higher dimensional RKHS, in a reproducible kernel Hilbert space, and things are not linear anymore as they were before. So things don't behave as nicely as they did in the PCA. But we can give an example just for a specific misclassification error, say 1%. This square, the area of that square, is proportional to the number of operations you need to do to perform KPCA, kernel PCA, to get a 1% misclassification error, which just needs seven components. Right? So this accounts both for the projections and for the kernel e evaluations you need to do. If we were to design, use experimental design to improve, to do sketching here, we could reduce this complexity by 98%. So this little square here is the complexity of the new one. We need 12 components now, but we only need to do 33 kernel evaluations. So that's a considerable reduction in complexity. And that's for small-ish small, small -ish pictures, 200 by 180. If you had larger pictures or a larger training set, the gains could be even larger. Uh, finally, we can look at a different problem, which is, say, more experimental, that has a more experimental design flavor which is the cold start problem in recommender systems. Right? So for recommender systems, say Netflix, when you start on Netflix, how does Netflix recommend movies to you if he, it has no idea what do you like? Right? So the, when you create a new profile, usually Netflix asks you to rate a couple of movies, and from them, there they'll guess, say, what do you like to, uh, in, in terms of their data set. Now the way we can do this, one of the ways we can do this, is by just thinking of the pool of experiments as movie ratings for new users. So I'm the new user on Netflix. My rating is just going to be Y. On movie E, it's just going to be Y. And I'm going to assume that this rating is actually a linear combination of the ratings of everyone that I have ever seen in the system, right? So my training set. I'm going to say that the rating of new users is just a linear combination of the, rate of all, uh, the ratings of old users, right? And now what I want to do is, which of the movies should you rate in order, or should I rate in this case, in order for them to guess what my theta is so that they can if, uh, estimate my, uh, my ratings. So if we look at this pictorially, what I mean is that, so my, ninth, my night Netflix is from the 90s, right? So it's only 90s movies. If I look, at, if I give him my uh, ratings and on those movies, they can do a projection onto the set of training data that they do have to evaluate my theta hat, which is sort of my profile. And then just evaluate my, say, the linear combination of the ratings of users based on my profile to get my rating on some new movies that they could recommend to me. So for example, they would figure out that I like animated movies and science fiction, but I'm not a big fan of sexy vampire movies, right? So if we do that on the each movie data set, just a sample, uh, sort of a slice of the each movie data set with just 200 movies and 500 users, so a very small slice. Actually, with 20 movies, we can achieve a mean absolute error of 1.5, which is pretty small. It's within one star, say, of my rating. Even though a random design, if we were to just do a random design, you would need more than 50, you need 50 just to get something that is close to two. So actually, with just 10% of the data set, of the number of movies, if I were to rate just 10% of them, you could guess what I would think about almost every movie. If the problem were a little different, for example, if I wanted to predict my favorite genre, right, based on, say, the movies that have, I give 
higher rating in a specific genre. Then with just those 25 movies, I can get within 2% of the error I would get by guessing if I were to rate all the 200 movies. So to conclude, experimental design is a problem that is useful, but it's hard, especially in low SNRs, right? which is the typical case in, in data that is taken by, um, by opportunistic samples, say. A and E optimality are not supermodular, which is what makes this problem hard. Otherwise, we could do greedy search. But they're almost supermodular. They're really close to that. So that means that we can use greedy experimental design to get sampling, to get experimental designs that are near optimal, very close to optimal. They don't only work well in practice. So greedy not only works well in practice, as we said in the beginning, it's also guaranteed to do pretty well. That's it. Thank you very much. The alpha depends. It depends on the. No, it depends. So alpha, alpha, and epsilon does depend on, on the SNR, right? Gamma, which is dependent on the data, not the data you have specifically, but on your priors, and your experiments. Yeah, but the, the, the previous definition, uh, the previous uh, here, would they depend on the data? No, I mean this. This here could depend on the data. Right? It, it would depend on which, on the F and on how a, that K depends on the data itself. But actually, let me go back here and say that in the general case, yes. In the MSC, for example, no. Because it only depends on the priors, which in a sense is the data. But it's, since we assume the priors are given, this could depend on the priors, but not on the data that you get, say, the movie itself. So approximate submodularity. Uh, so approximate submodularity is something that I put forward last year in December. There is a, a different concept which is called submodularity ratio, which is related to this, but is not exactly the same. And the different, the main uh, until last July, this July, they didn't have bounds on this alpha which were computable. So they were NP hard. They were based on RIP basically the bounds that they had for the submodularity ratio. Now this July, um, Krauss and his team, they published some bounds for the submodularity ratio, which are not depend, which are not NP hard to compute. They look very much like these bounds, actually. And the thing with the submodularity ratio is that you get a result that is very similar to this one. Actually, it looks like this, just replace alpha by the submodularity, submodularity ratio. So, there are other results, and they are, have been applied to different solutions now. So they call it sometimes weak submodularity. It's a name that I don't particularly like, because there's actually another paper on weak submodularity that has nothing to do with this, an older paper. But they call it weak, weak supermodularity, and they have applied that to other places in statistics mainly. Uh, but it has applications in control, for example, which uh, we have talked about, I think. Uh, and, and also in signal processing for sampling, which is where actually this started. This work, I started working on sampling, actually. So the Russian bounds in this alpha and epsilon, does, if I understand correctly, these bounds depend on um, what method you use, A optimality or E optimality? Yes, we have one bound for A optimality and one bound for E optimality. And what about epsilon bound? That one is very easy to calculate. The alpha bound for the E optimality, I don't know. I don't have one. That one is, like I said, the epsilon bound is very, there is a technique that works for any cost function. It's specific for each cost function, but it's a technique that works every time. For the, but it gives worst bounds, say, worst guarantees. For alpha, that's a specific technique for each, uh, for each cost function. So it depends on the cost function, definitely. These bounds are only valid for those cost functions. 
I did not. I did not. Uh, particularly because I didn't want to write the code to do it on big pictures, because that's much more complicated than on the small ones, right? But uh, the idea is that when you get when you get much larger pictures, the size of the designs might not increase that much. Yeah, that's the most interesting question. Yeah. How will it increase? That would be a great question. There is no there is no theoretical result on that. I have no theoretical result on that, and no empirical result either. <laughs> 